have to sit in traffic because no one wants to wait in any kind of traffic. I mean, that's just the way the way it is. Um, actually, Kirsten and I, uh, we, we DVR our favorite TV shows. And most of the time, it's not because we're not home when they're on. We don't like to watch commercials because it takes too long. So we DVR the show so we can fast forward through the commercial because I instantly want to get through this show, make it quicker as I can. You know, we... Um, we, uh, we, our family's been on vacation the last uh, week or so, and actually Caleb and I flew back early from vacation late last night, got home about uh, 11 o'clock, and our flight in Atlanta was delayed a little bit. And you know how many times, you know how stressed people get when their flight is delayed? It was like 20 minutes, and you thought we had been there for three hours. People are like freaking out. I'm going to miss my next flight. I can't believe, how, why are we sitting here so long? I'm like, it's been like 10 minutes, you know? What, what is it? I don't understand this. We were, we've been out on vacation, and uh, one of the things we did, we were out in uh, Nebraska and Iowa and went out, as Wendell said, to a little bit of the College World Series ahead of time here. And um, uh, one of the things we did when we were uh, uh, out there on vacation, we went fishing. Now, my kids, Kaylee and Caleb, are not the most patient people when it comes to fishing, especially my son. I don't know if, if you guys know my son at all, he's kind of wiry. I mean, he's always moving. He never stops. He's got to go, what's the next thing? And, and so fishing isn't, and he loves to fish, but it's like, cast it. Dad, nothing's biting. You know, I was like, dude, it didn't even hit the water yet. What do you mean nothing's biting? And, and so, I mean, it's the way, so we were out fishing, and, uh, and, and um, we're out fishing this one lake, and, and we didn't catch, I mean, kind of like one or two things, we went out there for about 30, 40 minutes, and nothing big, you know, a little fish, and Caleb's like, I, I, this, I, 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 this is no fun anymore. I'm like, so, so we had to go to a new lake, because he knew this, this lake, not a new lake, but this lake that we'd been to earlier on the weekend had been catching fish, so we went out there, and, he, and we caught together, the four of us, like 45 fish in about an hour. Now, nothing was like, we're going like that, but it didn't care. But it came like this, throws it out there, before it hits the water, fish are jumping up to get it. He's like, this is the greatest thing ever. Because it's instant gratification, right? You know? I'm like, Caleb, you do understand that people come to the lake and just throw their pole out there and just sit for hours because it's relaxing. Uh-uh, Dad, got to catch, got to catch. You know? That's the way we are uh, in life is we like things instantly. And, and waiting is not a strong point for a lot of us. Patience isn't something that's a strong characteristic for a lot of us, not everybody. I mean, it's been said that people, you know, ask for patience and pray for patience and pray, God, would you give me patience right now? Because I need it right now. And, and that's the reality of, of kind of how we pray for patience. In this next section of verses in James's letter, he encourages us about being patient about waiting on the Lord. I want you to grab your Bible or the Bible in the seat back in front of you, and I want you to go back to the book of James. We're in James chapter 5 today, getting ready to wrap up this study in the next week or two of just diving into these scriptures, this letter that James wrote. Today, we're in James chapter 5, and we're in verse 7. James chapter 5, verse 7. And I want to just read through verse 11, so just follow along with me. In this little section, James is talking about being patient, encouraging us to learn to wait and to be okay with waiting. In chapter, in chapter 5, verse 7, he says, Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it, until it gets the early and late rains. You too, be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Do not complain, brethren, against one another, so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. Now look at verse 10. As an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take a look at the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings. And the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. See, here, here's the point of these thoughts right here as James wrote this letter. Is this, I want to encourage you, audience, is what he's saying here. I want to encourage you to be patient until the Lord's coming. I want you to understand this, what patient means. He's saying, I want you to understand that patience means this. It's to, it's to stay put and stand fast when you feel like running away. Have you ever had those points? In a situation or a time of life, a season of life, you just felt like running away? Patience is learning to stand firm, to stand fast, even when you feel like running away. And what James is writing to us here in this section of his letter, he is kind of encouraging us with this, reminding us, that, that God is not going to right all of the wrongs on this earth until Jesus Christ returns. That, that's the reality. Sometimes that's hard to swallow. 
Because we want all of the rights wronged now. And he's saying, Jesus, he's reminding us that God is not going to right all the wrongs on this earth, all the sufferings, all the tribulations, all the wrongdoings. God is not going to right all of those wrongs until the return of Jesus Christ. So he says, be patient and endure until the return of Jesus, until the return of the Lord. When that time comes, until then, we have to endure. Until then, we have to be patient. Until then, we have to wait. And for many of us, that is not an easy thing to do. For many of the people that James was writing this letter directly to, it was not easy for them. They were complaining. They, they were judging. They were saying, hey, this person needs to be righted for that wrong. This thing needs to be righted that's wronged in this world. This thing that's been done to us, this thing that's been done to me. And, and James is reminding them, as tough as it is, be patient and endure until the return of our Lord. Patience. To stay put and stand fast even when we want to run away or give up. So James, what he's done here is he's given us three examples. Uh, three examples of patience. He first of all says, uh, let me remind you of the farmer. He said this, look back there in verse, uh, I think it's in verse, into verse 7. It says, the farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early and the late rains. All right, so he gives us an example. He says, I want you to look at and be reminded of the patience that a farmer has to have. A farmer, I mean, when we were out in the Midwest this week, and so you see all kinds of, you know, farm fields and corn fields and all kinds of stuff. And, and you see, you got to know what a farmer does. A farmer has these different seasons that he does different things. They have the times where they plow those fields up. They have the times and the seasons where they plant those seeds. A time of the season where they let the rains water and, and do what it has to do in the growing process. And then there comes that season of harvest. Harvesting, the season of, of, of reaping whatever that fruit or that crop may be, but it takes patience. Now, that farmer doesn't just plant that seed and, and just sit around and say, okay, huh, all right, we'll just wait and see what happens. You know, I don't see. He, he's busy about it. He does things. He says, okay, this season is the time for me to plow, so he works those fields, gets them ready, gets them prepped for the, for the planting of the seed. Then he comes to the season that it's planting, so he's planting. Then he has that season where it's being watered. He's letting the, the nature of God take its course, but he's not just sitting and waiting. He's doing things. He's making sure his machinery is all ready for the next season. He, he's making sure his barns are, are ready for to hold all the produce of the crops. And he's doing all this, so he's busy about it, being patient in doing what he has to do. So he's saying here, I want you to understand that the farmer waits for the early rains and the late rains. What he's talking about here, he's understanding this, that the early rains that would have come at this time, what he's talking about in that phrase is the rains that would come and soften up the soil so the farmer could, could, could plow it and get it ready to plant his seeds. The late rains were the rains that came later on before the harvest and it would rain on those plants and those plants would grow and do the natural things that God designed them to do because of the rain that helped those crops mature. And it says that farmer the farmer understands this whole process. The farmer understands that, that, that there's this process, and he's willing to go through this process of waiting and being patient because he understands that there is this, uh, this great crop, this great produce at the end. That if I wait for all of this to happen, if I patiently wait, there's going to be a great reward at the end. You have a great crop of corn, some great Iowa sweet corn or Nebraska sweet corn. Or are you going to have some great, great crops here, some great apples, some great oranges, whatever it may be. You're going to have great crops from that if you're patiently waiting. That's exactly what he's reminding us. As he's reminding us, it is a time of be patient the way a farmer is. I love the story of the example uh, from, from a bamboo farmer. All right, we don't understand a lot of bamboo, but, but I love the story of bamboo because I've been able to read the story about what a bamboo farmer does is he takes a bamboo plant and he plants that and he begins to put it in place and begins to water that bamboo plant. He waters it the first year and it does not grow a single inch. He, he waters it for the second season and he fertilizes it and does what he has to do for it and, and that bamboo plant for the second season does not grow a single inch. He does that for the third season, for the third year, not a single inch. For the fourth year and the fourth season, he does that. He waters it every season, prepares it, does it. And it, that bamboo plant does not grow a single inch in those first four years. But in that fifth season, in that fifth year, that bamboo farmer waters that bamboo plant. And in less than that next year, in less than a year, that bamboo plant grows 80 feet tall. Now, some people say, well, does a bamboo plant grow 80 feet in one year or in five years? It's in five years. 
Because if any time during those first four years that farmer would not have watered the bamboo plant, it would have died. So he has to be patient saying, I know what i got to do at this time. I know I'm not seeing a lot of results. I know I'm not seeing a lot of changes. But I just got to keep doing what needs to happen because when that fifth year comes, boom, growth, explosion, there it goes. And sometimes in our life, we don't see instant results. We don't see instant change. So we just give up. I'm not going to do it anymore. We begin to walk away. We have marriages that are struggling and we begin to work on them and we really are doing things, but we don't see some instant change. We don't see some instant um, results. And all of a sudden, we have, I'm just give up. I, I tried. It didn't work. We, we have this situation in our life, some, some damaged relationships, some things that are hurt, some whatever struggles that we're going through. And like, I'm trying to change. I'm trying to help repair this relationship. And we don't see any instant change, so we give up. We, we have this thing, this situation that we're going through, this struggle, this tribulation, this trial. And we just said, I know what, I'm working, but I don't see anything changing, so I just give up. we got to be like the bamboo farmer that says, you know what, I'm just going to keep doing what i got to do. And eventually, I believe there's going to be some results. There's going to be change. That's what James is reminding his, his, his audience here, sort of reminding us today, is we need to have the patience of a farmer. Keep doing the things that God wants us to do. I want you to look at a couple of verses. Keep your hand in, in James, but flip back just a little bit to Galatians. you got Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, right after 1 and 2 Corinthians. Galatians, first of all, go to Galatians chapter 6. Look at this one verse in Galatians chapter 6. In verse 9, Paul is writing this letter. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9, this is what it says. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. Let us not stop what's doing good, because in due time we'll, we'll, we will reap the results of that goodness. Just like that bamboo farm. Don't, don't stop watering because in year five, you're going to see explosion. You're going to see amazing results. And that's God saying, hey, don't stop doing good. Don't grow weary in doing good. You will see fruit. You will see results of that. Be patient in the Lord. Be patient in waiting in the Lord. In Galatians chapter five, in verse 22, just right before this, it gives us this idea that what God wants to do in us is develop these fruits, these produce, just like the farmer has to go and wait for this crop to grow because he knows that at the end of that crop, he's going to have some great fruits and some great vegetables. He's going to have some great crops coming out of that thing if he just patiently waits for them. And God is saying this to us, and Paul is reminding us in Galatians chapter 5, that God wants to produce some great fruits. We call them the fruits of the Spirit. You probably heard about them. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, it says this. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. It's like God is wanting to, to grow these characteristics in us as followers of him, as we mature. Remember, this is what the whole letter of James is about. It's about spiritually maturing in our relationship and as a follower of Jesus Christ. So as we're maturing, God is wanting to develop these things in us. But guess what? Those things take time. Those things take process. And sometimes part of that process is the heat of the sun and the drownings of the rain and sometimes the coolness of the day. So sometimes in our life, it's, it's the gentle times in life. Sometimes it's the hard struggles in life. Sometimes it, it's the rains and the storms of life that grow these things in us. So we have to understand, you know what? I'm going to be patient. And I'm going to wait on the Lord because this thing that I'm going through right now does not seem very fair. I wish it was over. I wish God would just solve it right now. But he's saying I'm allowing it to happen because I'm trying to grow something in you. So be patient. Be patient. And wait on the Lord, just as the farmer has to wait. Then he gives us another example. Back in James, back in our context of our scriptures today, James, uh, look at verse, let's go down to verse 10. This is an example, brethren, of suffering and patience. Take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. James is referring to, and he, remember his audience was a Jewish audience here. They would have totally understood the prophets of the Old Testament that we have as the Old Testament now. They would have understood the context of the prophets and he says, so I want you to take in, into account the patience of the endurance of the prophets. Here they have these prophets. We can look at Daniel, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Isaiah. We can look at so many of them and say, hey, they were, they were, their message was to proclaim the coming of God. They're proclaiming the message of God, proclaim the, the coming of Jesus, proclaim whatever their message that God had given them to proclaim. And yet here are these men who were in the will of God, and yet they suffered. 
You look at it time and time again at the prophets. If you looked and studied the life of the prophets, here they are doing the work, doing the good, doing the work of God, doing the will of God, and yet they suffered. They were doing things, and he refers to it in his phrase. He says, they were proclaiming, they were preaching, they were teaching, they were speaking, in his phrase, in the name of the Lord. So they're speaking on behalf of God, and yet they were persecuted. So many of the prophets were, were persecuted for their message, and yet they're doing good, right? They're doing good in the name of the Lord. So if I'm in there, I'm going, God, I'm doing your work. God, I'm proclaiming in your name. God, I'm doing the things, I'm in the will of you, and yet I'm still suffering, yet I'm still being persecuted. You know what, what the life of the prophets remind us is this, is that God cares for us even when we go through suffering. I say even because that's our mindsets. Well, well God, do you even care about me right now? God cares about us when we go through sufferings for his sake. That's what the prophets did. They suffered, they'd endured. See, their, their life was sometimes tested and challenged so that their life became a visual message of the glory of God. All of a sudden, their life, how they endured, how they, how they suffered, and yet they still proclaimed in the, name of, in the name of the Lord, showed people that they gave their message so much more power because their life lived out, showed power in God. So here are these people, these prophets, that they're proclaiming all this message of God. They're doing the work of God. And yet people see them suffer and people see them struggle. And yet they're still pointing people to God. Yet they're still trusting in God. All of a sudden now their message has a lot more power to it. But so often what happens in our life is we're saying all of a sudden things go wrong in our life the way we see it. Or we start to go through a struggle. We start to go through a trial. We start to go through a tribulation. And all of a sudden we just give up and say, God, why would you allow this to happen? I was doing good. I was in your, I was following you. I'm doing things for you. I was doing good. And yet you're allowing this to happen. He says, let me remind you of the prophets who lived their life doing my work. And yet they still suffered. They were still persecuted. So be patient. Be patient like the prophets. Then he gives us a third example. He, he mentions it in verse 11 when he says, We count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings. You've heard of Job, and maybe you have heard of Job, maybe you haven't, but let's turn back to the book of Job and look at Job's story. It's right about in the middle of the Bible, in the Old Testament, right before Psalms. And I want you to look at the story of Job. Go to Job chapter 1. Now, here, here's what we do know about Job. We're told about it here in the very first verse where it says, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And then look at this phrase. I'm in Job chapter 1, verse 1. It says this, the second half of verse 1. And that man was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. So first of all, let's understand who Job is. All right? Job is not a guy that's out there living a righteous life, living an ungodly life, living a life just out there on his own, partying, doing whatever he wants to do. He is a man that's described as a man of integrity, a man who feared God, a man who, is, who shuns evil and stays away from evil. He is a godly man living his life in view of God's mercies, living his life in view of God's greatness, and he is actually honoring God with his life and his actions. So you say, man, this is a good guy. But now let's watch what happens. Because what happens is he, he's, a very, he's a very blessed man. Let's look at this. Look at verse 2. Keep on. It says, His seven sons and three daughters were born to him. His possessions also were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. And that man was the greatest of all the men in the east. Not only was he a man that, was, uh, that honored God with his life, God had blessed him with great possessions. He had blessed him with great family. He had had these seven sons and three daughters. He had all this cattle. He had these camels. He had sheep. He had all these servants to take care of them. He had oxen. He had everything. It says that he was one of the greatest men of his area, of his region, the greatest men of all the East. A godly man who was blessed by family and possessions from God. Had it all. And yet, he faces a lot of trials and tribulations. Because what happens is the scriptures tell you, if you were to read all of the first few chapters of Job, you'll see this, where uh, Satan approaches God one day and says, hey, I, uh, I want to uh, attack somebody on this earth. And, and, uh, and God says, well, have you considered Job? Job is a servant of mine, strong man. I mean, he's got things together. And, and, uh, and he says, well, of course he has everything together. Look at all the stuff you've given him. 
man, you, you've given him all this stuff. You, you, you've given him everything he has. He's, he's, of course he's going to praise you. Of course he's going to live his life for you when you've given him all this stuff. And so God says, okay, tell you what, you can go after him, but you can't touch him. You can't touch his body. So Satan begins to test him. Look at this. In verse, chapter 1, verse 13. It says, now on the day when his sons, this is talking about Job, on the day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them, and the Sabians attacked and took them. They also slew the servants and the, with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Here he is, he's with his, he, he, he's, his sons and daughters are in a house. It's just, I don't want you to understand, Job isn't with them. He's there in a house, and here's Job by himself, and it says that all this good life, life is happening, things are good, and a, a servant comes to him and says, all of your oxen and your donkeys have been stolen by this tribe, and your servants were all killed. Look in verse 16. While he was still speaking, that means he's still standing there telling a story to Job. While he was still speaking, another also came in and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I alone have escaped to tell you. He's getting some bad news and all of a sudden now some more bad news comes in. And all of a sudden there's this fireball that has come down. Maybe it's some kind of form of lightning or whatever it is. And it's burned up the sheep and all the servants who were taking care of them. Now look at this verse in verse 17. While he was still speaking... Have you ever had one of those days where bad news just kept coming? Yeah, this is one of those days for Job. While he is still speaking, another one, a third one comes in, and he says, the Chaldeans formed three bands and made a raid on the camels and took them and slew the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Seriously? Look at the next verse. Because it says, while he was still speaking, a fourth messenger has come in, and he says, your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind, a tornado type wind, came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house. And it fell on the young people and they died. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Now his kids, his kids have died in this storm of some type. All of his possessions of his cattle and his oxen and his and his servants that took care of them have been taken or, or, or died. And, and now all of a sudden, while this messengers are just keep coming, this last messenger comes in and says, your kids have just been killed and died in the storm. And we think that our bad news piles up sometime. Look at verse 28. I'm sorry, verse 20. It says, Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. He said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Through all this, Job did not sin nor blame God. He says, how does he respond? How does he respond to all this bad news? He says he literally responds, and in a cultural thing there, he tore his robe, and he fell on his face, he shaved his head, and he worshipped God. All of this stuff is happening. All this stuff begins to just pile onto him. And how does he respond to it? He worships God and he says, Naked I came from my mother's room. Naked I returned. I mean, all this, I didn't have all this stuff when I was here. I don't need all this stuff. It's not that important to me. And he says, All of this, he says, I will praise God when he blesses me with things, but I'll also praise God when he takes those things away because he gives and he takes away. And I love the last verse there. It says, Through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. God, because that's what we do most of the time. God, I can't believe you did this. Why would you do this, God? And we blame God. James was reminding us of Job and saying, hey, what if you have the patience of Job that in those troubles, in those sufferings, in those times, those seasons of, 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 of growing, what if you just respond to those things and worship? And you would think that maybe this stopped for Job. Satan comes back to God and God says, see, I told you. Told you. Told you how Job would respond. He said, well, of course, of course he did because people will let things come and go. But, but if you were to allow me to touch him, yeah, if I were to, to affect him personally, he would turn his back on you. He said, okay, you can touch him. You can touch his physical body, but you cannot take his life. You cannot kill him. So Satan, in chapter 2 and verse 7, 
Chapter 2 and verse 7, Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his feet to the crown of his head. And he took a pot shirt to, to scrape himself while he was sitting among the ashes. And his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Why don't you curse God and die? So now all of a sudden, Job, his physical body is affected with an illness. There's some kind of boil, some kind of sores. And it says that he takes broken pottery and he scrapes the sores and, and the, 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 the itchiness of it, the, the soreness of it. And he's scraping it and his wife looks at him and says, Seriously, are you still going to praise God now? Are you still, why don't you just curse God and just die? Just be done with this. Why don't you just run away? Why don't you give up and just run away? Look how Job responds in verse 10. It says, but he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speak. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. You see, Job first responded to that first trial in worship. Job responded in this trial and this testing in acceptance. He accepted what God had allowed to happen in his life. He said, are we to accept the goodness from God? Are we to accept the good times from God? The blessings from God? Are we supposed to accept those and not and, and reject all the struggles? He says, I'm going to accept whatever God because I believe God has my good in mind. I believe God has, has my goodness in his mind, so I'm going to continue to worship him. I'm going to continue to praise him. And yes, this hurts. Yes, I don't understand this. Yes, I don't wish, I wish this was over. I wish someone would fix it, and I wish they would fix it now. But I'm going to be patient. I'm going to stand fast in worshiping God because I believe God truly cares about me and has my good in mind. Well, now I want you to turn to the very end of Job. Job chapter 42. And I want you to see how the Scriptures show us the end of Job's story. Job chapter 42, look at verse 10. It says in verse 10, The Lord restores the fortunes of Job when he prayed for his friends, and the Lord increased all that Job had twofold. Then all of his brothers and all of his sisters and all who had known him before came to him and they ate bread with him in his house and they consoled him and covered him for all the adversities that the Lord had brought on him. And each one gave him one piece of money and each a ring of gold. The Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginnings. And he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels and 1,000 yoke of oxen and 1,000 female donkeys. He had seven sons and three more daughters. He named them and he gives them the name. And look at verse 15. In all the land no women were found so fair as Job's daughters. And their father gave them inheritances among their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years and he saw his sons and his grandsons four generations. And Job died an old man and full of days. See, life didn't end during those struggles. And sometimes we're like, it's all over. It's all over. Life is done. He was patient. He said, I'm going to continue to trust in God. I believe God has my good. And God showed him, yes, I do have your good. He says he blessed him twofold. More than his beginning days. You see, as James is reminding us in this section of his letter, he's encouraging us to be patient in times of suffering. That we have to be patient when it's hard to be patient. Patient. Standing firm, standing strong, staying when we want to run away and give up. We've got to be like the farmer. We have to wait for that spiritual harvest. Those, those things that God's trying to grow in us spiritually. We need to be like the prophets. We need to be willing to endure and continue to live out our life for God. Continue to proclaim the message of God with our life. We have to be like Job. Be willing to endure through struggles. Continue to keep our eyes focused on God. That we know loves us. That will take care of us. And provide for us. That he is a God that does not allow us to suffer needlessly. I want you to hear that. God is a God that does not let us suffer 
needlessly. Maybe that season of life or that time in life is a growing process for you. Maybe God is trying to teach you something. Maybe God is trying to grow something in you. Be patient and wait on a God who has our best in mind.